Hey guys, Jamie here. I'm here today talking with Dave Watkins, who is a counselor based in the Sydney area, and I'm so excited about this podcast. Hi, Dave. How are you? Good, Jamie. What about you? I'm doing really well. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Cool. I've been so excited about this interview because, as our listeners probably don't know, you are actually my counselor, and you walked me through a lot of my journey and recovery from chronic fatigue syndrome, and I... I thought it'd be so good to have you on the podcast as sort of like we can talk through that process of of how I went from coming to you with like pretty bad anxiety and not depression, but but like some some pretty heavy stuff and like crying in your office to like, I don't know, two and a half years later, or six months later, recovered from chronic fatigue syndrome. <laughs> You're laughing. Do I have your permission to share it all? <laughs> Yes, we can we can talk about my journey, because um, yeah, I think the first time I came in, it was like I couldn't even talk because I was just crying. Sure. So so sure. there was a lot of emotions there. So um, <laughs> can you first just tell us a little bit about your background in counseling and how what got you into it, and then we'll get into sort of my journey. Sure, um, career corporate guy for thirty years. Um, managed big businesses all around the world and just got sick and tired of making money as the only issue. So I wanted more meaning and fulfilment. So I left corporate work and started um, business consulting and then coaching. And it's a funny thing, Jamie, because the closer you get to people, the more problems they start revealing. So I remember one man asking me, Dave, can you help me with some marriage advice? And I thought, Oh God, what do I do now? <laughs> so I thought I'd better get some more training, right? So hence why the counselling. Um, <clears throat> but it's interesting in terms of pain management. I remember here at home when we were doing major renovations, we put, had a pool uh, put in and the guy that was excavating it, he was quite rude to my wife one morning. And um, it's like, what's going on here? So I went out to talk to him and confront him. I said, you know, what's going on? And uh, he, he apologised and said, look, I'm just in chronic pain. Oh, wow. And he said, I, I've just taken some pain medication. So he said, you know, please apologise to your wife, but it just gets me down a lot of the time. So that was my first real entree into people managing pain. And I remember feeling, God, this poor guy, um, he was an excavator, pool excavator. So it wasn't an, an easy choice to just walk away from it. Um, so my heart went out to him and yeah, that, that was my first real experience of it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's really, I think it's, it's one of those things that's invisible. So I, you know, yeah. I mean, people like I tell people, if you ask me any given day, if I'm in pain, I will always say yes, because I'm always in pain. <laughs> And no one would know, I mean, most people wouldn't know unless I say, unless I tell them just because it's, it's so invisible and people don't want to bring other people down with their pain, right? They don't want to be like, oh yeah, you know, like eight out of 10 pain today. Um, but unfortunately, there's a real connection between pain and our mental wellness, isn't there? Yeah. So pain my can really take you down. What do you, why, why do you think that is? Well, um, I don't know about you, but <laughs> when I miss out on a, on a meal, I, I start getting a bit, what they call hangry. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a combination of hungry and angry, right? Um, if I just miss a good night's sleep, you know, you just don't operate quite as well the following day. Um, now, if we look at pain, that, that's like missing out on a sleep times 21 days um, so it really affects our ability to think and be clear and focused and you know I guess we start wondering what's wrong with me um, so that is the beginning of anxiety and can lead to depression yeah yeah and so I guess back the track up to like two and a half years ago or two oh. years ago uh, almost when I came <laughs> to your office and um, 
I was dealing with some, like, a breakup, and it was pretty, like, I was very anxious, and there was, like, came, all of this stuff came up, and we can go into a little bit more detail about it, but I did counseling with you for two, two months, two and a half months every week, yeah. and I remember going and talking to you and realizing I had emotions and then being like, oh my gosh, emotions, and then feeling them for the first time and crying on the floor for hours in a really healthy way because I was finally let my, letting myself feel all of these things. And I, after two and a half months, I physically felt like the chronic pain I was in, not go away completely, but I experienced significant relief. Um, my anxiety decreased significantly. And that's, I think I was completely surprised that that was the outcome, that my mental health and the negative core beliefs I had about myself were so linked to my body. It's a huge connection. Yeah, but... I, mean, I describe it a bit like a whack-a-mole game. I don't know if people remember them, but you have a, like a hammer and you'd be bashing down one thing. And as that one went down, another one would come up. So if we're not, um, if, if we tend to think or intellectualize our lives a lot, then and we're holding on to our feelings, they end up trying to come out in other ways. Yeah. Yeah. And for you, I think it was connected to the, the pain. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, yeah. And so when we're talking about like even physical health issues, do you like, in your personal opinion, do you believe that maybe a lot of those come from health, mental health issues or? Well, they're, they're intricately linked, put it that way. So yeah, um, mental health can lead to uh, physical pain and physical pain can definitely lead to poor mental health. Yeah, there is a connection. Yeah, and I, I was just looking at some of the statistics that you had sent over previously and it and from what I'm seeing, people with the highest levels of distress are 32% more likely to die from cancer. If you look at um, depression, it's found to be associated with heart disease. And um, chronic fatigue is often misdiagnosed as depression. All of these things because it's so linked. So you specialize, I guess, in trauma. And um, yeah. I've actually had referred quite a few people to you and I've had some Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> I've had some people come back with feedback that they've also improved in terms of their chronic pain and chronic fatigue and right. um what do you think do you do you see like a core issue in all of this cuz I know for me it was um I've had a deep core belief that I was worthless and that I need to be perfect and I actually interviewed someone else previously wow. and she had the same core belief and she recovered when she resolved that core belief wow so in your opinion or in your experience what is there like a root cause of a lot of this stuff there can be without me saying a hundred percent yes um see we bring into our adulthood what we didn't resolve in our earlier life and often our Western culture is very strong on thinking our way through problems and issues. And, you know, don't get me wrong, that, that's, that's an important function that we all have, but um, when it leads to our feelings and emotions being excluded, that's not always a good thing. And some of us learned as children to suppress feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we Australians are particularly good at that. <laughs> yeah. So um, <clears throat> it's usually a significant event later in life that ties us back to the suppressed emotions, yeah? Now, we're sort of tripartite beings. You know, we're body, mind and spirit. So if we just shut off our emotions, it's, it's like we're hacking off our arm and going, oh, we don't need that. Yeah. It just doesn't work. So um, what I find is that when we reintroduce people to their feelings, um, there is often a, a traumatic event or, or a, a big hurt in their life mm. that they haven't really attended to. And that's what the emotions are for, to help us deal with painful memories and issues. Yeah. 
So all I've really done is reconnect people, and you in particular, with who you really, really are, which is a great person, yeah? So when we do that, uh, people stop thinking as poorly about themselves. We reconnect them to the causing event, which they don't see as, as bad anymore, and they can walk ahead living their life a lot more freely. Yeah. Yeah, freely. I guess freedom even, yeah, from a, just like there's a cloud lifted. Like I'm not, I mean, at least for me, it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm not, people like me. <laughs> I'm loved like this is basic stuff and I think what that's what's so crazy and so when we're talking about why what do you like what do you think is the biggest barrier from people connecting with their emotions like is it society is it like the way we're raised what well I think it's generational a and b it is our culture a bit Mm. but Um, If I look back, I guess, some examples from my own life, um, you know, we were taught um, it's all about what you did. You know, who you are, that's just not really that important. So we learned as children, um, you know, it's important to get things right, yeah, so that we were always trying to please people and to get things right. And the the problem with that is um, we learned as part of that process to exclude or limit our feelings. Um, So, you know, a child who who, um, is left alone a lot of the time by parents or when parents are just working really hard, the child says, well, um, they don't love me. Because if they loved me, they'd be here, yeah? So because we, we don't rationalise or intellectualise very well as children, we take those as deeply held beliefs. Mm. So in turn, a child says, well, I'm no good the way I am. Yeah. So therefore, I must gain value some other way. So as a result, they start thinking, I've got to do things in order for other people to be pleased with me. And that's the beginning of it because people pleasing then becomes more ferocious later in life and becomes a bit of perfectionism. And why? Because we learned early on that feelings weren't really, you know, that that was dangerous, it was vulnerable. So we, we avoided them. Yet they're a big part of who we are. Yeah. So on that note, if, like, for example, if like my for myself or anyone listening, um, it really resonates with that. Oh, maybe I'm focusing so much on what I do as as so important. How do you then go from that to understanding value in yourself? I know, I know it's a big question. There's a lot you can do. But I guess maybe what are some things where it's like, can I go you go from that sort of a mentality to okay, like I'm acknowledging my emotions, who I am as a person external from all of that. Sure. So um, a really basic one for me um, was given to me by an an old manager way back in one of my corporate jobs. He said to me, Dave, what are you doing that's nice for you? And I looked at him as if he was speaking Marsh. It's like, what? Um, he said, do you do nice things for you each day? And I remember thinking, actually, no, I don't. Yeah. So it's back then that I started going out purposefully, intentionally, to do something good for me each day. And what I found originally is it made me feel guilty. I thought, why am I doing this? I don't deserve it. Wow. So, so it made me think, where does that um, core belief come from? So... When I pursued it and continued doing it, eventually you'd get to your pleasant event and go, wow, I'm looking forward to this and I, I'm, I really enjoyed it. So mm-hmm. when you're doing something pleasant for you, you're actually loving you. And we call that good self-care. So particularly in the helping industries, of which I'm one and so are you, um, self-care each day is just so important. 
because it looks after us, A and B, we're telling ourselves that we're actually good enough to take care of and love. Just just really important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's like it's like one, it's not only okay to look after yourself, but two, it's important. I you have to love like loving yourself, I think maybe can be one of the most beautiful things as humans that we can do. Cause then it gives us all of this capacity to love others. Oh. Um, and so important in the sense of you don't have to travel halfway around the world. You just go and buy a cup of coffee and read the paper for 15 minutes. Yeah. It, it's simple and everyone can do it. Yeah. So, you know, when was, you know, the last time you went and had your hair cut or had your nails done or went and had a massage? I mean, yeah. these things we sort of take for granted, don't we? But they're really important. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm glad that you brought that up because that was one of the big things in my journey um, with, with through counselling and even just continue, continuing into today. Like, I often, oh. like, I'm a student, right? So I don't have that much money. But sometimes I'll want to, like, buy something for myself. And I'm like, you know what? I'm important enough to spend the money on. And that's been, like, a huge shift for me to be like, you know what? It's actually worth I'm actually worth spending that money, even though I don't have that much, because that's looking after, that's my self-care activity for today, for this week. And um, I'm glad they were talking about this too, because for our listeners, I wanted to actually really touch on this point. This is something we're going to be putting out on our social media in a blog post, this idea oh. of people in the chronic illness community actually doing self-care activities for themselves and having that become become a part of the rhythm of of our life like even if they're if for people that are quite ill that can't get out much like what's at least one thing you can do per day that is good for you and so we're going to be putting those on our website on our Instagram for those listening so have a look right. chronichope.org under blog um, and Jamie, that's such a good point, such an important point we underscore because, um, you know, years ago, I, I've sort of been short-sighted for a long time and a lot of the guys I play golf with got their eyes lasered there yeah. and I looked into it and, and it was back then it was $1,800 per eye to get it done. It was oh. pretty expensive. Um, and I'll be going, oh, no, I'll leave it for a few years. But the reality is we'll spend five grand on two new couches, but we won't spend 3600 on ourselves. It's amazing, isn't it? So what is that saying about how we value ourselves? Yeah. Exactly. And even for me, it's like I'm happy to shout a coffee or a meal for someone. But when it comes to, oh, am I going to go buy myself a pizza? Because I want a pizza. <laughs> like, like that's, that's okay. Right. I need to do that for me. Yeah. Well, the other point you've just met, uh, mentioned is there's an organisation called the Northern Pain Centre. They operate out of a few hospitals, North Shore Private here in Sydney, and they talk about the 12 pillars of well-being for managing pain. Okay. And I saw this and thought, hey, that's really good. Um, I'll just read them to you, but one is understanding, yeah. understanding the issue. Two is movement, do some exercise. Mm -hmm. Three is rest, make sure you get good rest. Four, nutrition. Really important to have a good, healthy, balanced diet. Five, gut health. Do we take probiotics and all those sorts of things? Six, connection. Our network of friends and influence and family, really important for us. Engagement. Do we have passions and do we engage in them? Um, eight, purpose. What is our purpose in life and are we fulfilling it? Nine, mindfulness. The, the number of times I do with clients a breathing meditation and they say at the end, oh, Dave, I feel really relaxed. And yet we in our busy lives don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> so 10, gratitude, 
11, empathy. That's what you're talking about before, loving others, yeah? And 12, support. So it's a lot of about connection and engagement with people, yeah? Yeah, I think that's actually really big. Sorry, continue. No, no, no. I was finished. Go ahead. Oh, um, I just wanted to mention, like, as well, on that note with connection and, and and all of that. Um, I remember not too long ago, there was a time I came into your office and I said, and I mentioned that I was in pain, like pretty bad back pain that day. And I generally, with people, I'll mention pain if it's particularly bad, but they don't like pay attention to it because it's not. But I don't care if I haven't had it. They don't. And that's okay. But I usually play it down. And, and um, at the end of the session, you, you stopped and you're like, oh, can, can I pray for your back? Like, because you're in pain and I think I burst into tears and I was like, oh my gosh, no one ever acknowledges that I'm in pain, you know? And I don't usually talk about it because no one acknowledges it. So I think even just for the community, there's such like, the encouragement would be to actually talk about it with people that have that empathy and can say, oh, like, can I support you? Can I, how can I, can I pray for you? Can I get you something? Can I sit here and listen, yeah. like, it's okay to talk about it as well. Sure. And it's part of that journey of dealing with pain. Sure. And I think too, um, there's a bit of grief associated with it too, in the sense that this pain is taking away some of my enjoyment of life. And that's natural. And we shouldn't um, exclude that in people who are suffering pain because mm -hmm. um, you know, life is pretty tough even without pain. Uh, if you add pain on top of that, it, it can produce a lot of sadness and deep emotions. Yeah. Yes, that's actually such a good way to say that, especially even if you look at like the environment we're in, like the global pandemic. Um, I think like a lot of people might be struggling. I know during lockdown, I struggled with pain pretty badly because it was I couldn't get out I couldn't use my normal coping mechanisms my normal pleasant events um, oh. and so the idea of just and my release was sitting there and like being sad and letting myself have that moment of grief and sadness and for I guess for our listeners it's like it's okay to be sad it's okay to be sad that you have a chronic illness to be disappointed to express that disappointment absolutely and to sit in that for for a time i mean at least for me that's been helpful but as well there's always been that moment where it's like okay i've sat in this and now next step is hope next step is moving forward so and jamie it's a great point you make because Two or three years ago, I had um, what was called labyrinthitis. It's a virus in the inner ear. And I was laid out for a week. Oh, wow. And finally, I got better. Um, but I was left with tinnitus, which is like ringing in the ear. Mm -hmm. And it's constant. It's always there. So I'm not at all comparing tinnitus with pain that you experience. But even for me... Having tinnitus there constantly, I know it affected my ability to be there for people. So, you know, I've got to be careful for me about stress and about my self-care and about how many sessions I take on. It's, it's just, I think, having a, a whole holistic approach to life and, and managing things calmly and appropriately and making sure that I smell the roses as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. And thanks for sharing that. I didn't I didn't realize. But and it I think it just goes to show you everyone kind of has their most people have their own struggle. And it sounds so basic to say, but like if we all just had a little bit more empathy and understanding, the world would be a better place. Well, <laughs> when there's up to 15% of people out there that experience pain, I couldn't agree more with that sentiment. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not even just like chronic pain, like 50% of Australians have a chronic illness. That's literally half the population of Australia. The statistic is seven out of 10 in America. And 
it's almost like the norm. So why is it so stigmatized and why aren't we doing more to help? And I think that's one of the things I really appreciate about what you do is, is and just counselors in general is, because I think it just, it's so important to look after the whole person and the way I look at the health journey is you have your doctor, you have your special, your GP, your specialist, your counselor, your nutritionist, your physio, and you need a whole network in order to sort of find that oh. cover. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> it's funny too, because being Australian, we, we tend to be more stoic. You know, we will hide things. Yeah. Um, I mean, it comes from our cultural background, but I remember as a kid, you know, unless you had a bone sticking out of your arm, it's like, get out of here, go and play. <laughs> so we're sort of sensitised to not expressing pain. Does that make sense? No, I don't. I'm so, just thinking of all the Aussie friends that, like, are that way. So it's really counterintuitive what you're talking about, but you're absolutely right. Um, it's like take every advantage you can. Why not? particularly if it's something as debilitating as a chronic illness, yeah. So on that note, I guess, what um, what advice would you give to someone living, whether they be in Australia or somewhere else, living with a chronic condition? Like, what would you say is the number one thing, number one, number two, number three thing that could really help them in their journey? Well, I think this... 12 pillars of well-being is it's like i couldn't write it better but in summary self-care really important um two understanding you know finding out information's power yeah um, because a lot of people suffer from it and just one person might have a secret that'll work for you uh, and three is nutrition and rest you know that's three and four sorry <laughs> that's okay <laughs> You're not a mathematician. If you can do those four, I think you can make up to a twenty percent better life for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you're so spot on, and we'll put those twelve pillars up on our website as well for the list, all of our listeners to have a look at. Um, yeah. And then sort of a list of suggested pleasant events or self care activities, yeah. and really just give that option. And I love that. Um, I love that you say about understanding because that's one of the things we want we're doing at chronic cope is it's it's we're giving people like we're sharing stories sharing resources we're offering resources in terms of like what is this condition how do what are some ways to treat it where can i find a medical practice or a health professional that can that can treat that and so it's like trying to sort of bring bring together all of these different resources so that people can have better health outcomes and so good, Jamie. I, I, this is so needed in Australia. You know, and I hope it really is effective and brings people who are in pain to, to, to have a better life. I mean, that's what we all want. Yeah, yeah I, I hope that it continues to really just help people. Like, that's my ultimate goal. And um, I, that's part of the reason why I wanted to bring you on, because I know that we share similar hearts from that perspective, is it's like... Cool. We just want to help people, like, be yes. the best version of themselves. And yep. um, for our listeners, if you want to get in touch with Dave, maybe do a counseling session with him, or his information is up on our health professionals database. Um, he's based in on the northern beaches, but he also does Zoom sessions. So feel free to reach out to uh, him. And at Waterloo and at Wollongong. Yeah, so Waterloo, Wollongong. Northern Beaches, Northern Zoom. Beaches. So essentially anyone from the world could schedule a session with you. <laughs> Got clients right around the world. Now. As long as they speak English. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks so much for just taking the time to come on the podcast. And for those listening, if you have any questions or want to reach out to Dave, his information is up there. And thanks again. We really oh, enjoyed having Jamie, you. Jamie, I'll, I'll come on anytime you need because this is a really big issue and we need to, to allow people not to be stoic about it, to talk yeah. and to get out there and find ways to, to manage it better. So it's good. We'll get there.